All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast, BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Today we're going back to the year 2000, to the state of California, and looking at the murder of Greg de Villers, who was murdered by his wife, Kristen Rossum. So the prosecution argued, and so the jury decided, gave her life in prison. Kristen Rossum was a toxicologist who was accused of murdering her husband. And we mentioned recently on this channel about how kind of ridiculous it is to try and commit a murder by poisoning because you're leaving all the evidence in the crime scene. Like, I mean, all the evidence is left behind. Not to mention she was a toxicologist. There are a variety of ways we can learn about true crime cases, but this is the first time I ever found out about a true crime case because of Bing, like Bing.com. I was reading about a different one, and it was in kind of the related searches, and I just clicked on this thing, and I've been following it recently. It, but the thing is, though, with uh, Kristen Rossum, she is someone who had everything going for her. Her and her husband did. They were newlyweds. And they both had careers. They were both doing very well in life. Kristen Rossum, it was somebody who got addicted to methamphetamine at the age of 16. And one of the things that I thought was really downplayed by some of the media and some of the documentaries that are on YouTube is the relationship she actually had with Greg DeVillers, who would go on to become her husband, was that he was the person who probably helped her got off methamphetamine, but they always say that they were newlyweds and married for a short time before the murder. But they were actually dating for five years. And this was going from age 17 to 15. Like, I mean, Greg DeVillers, I recall, was 20 at the time when they started dating. And Kristen Rossum was 17. But they dated for five years before they got married. So this isn't exactly a super short acquaintance I mean, the, the CBS article kind of uh, de gave us these details. Once again, I think some of the documentaries left this out. But how does this go on to become the American Beauty murder? Why are people even calling it that? Well, what happened was, Kristen Rossum's addiction to methamphetamine relapsed. It was something that she could never get away from. And she developed an affair with one of her colleagues, who was actually her supervisor at the toxicology lab, an interesting note about this was, I believe the show was called Crime Watchers. Not Crime Watch, but Crime Watchers. That's what I saw in the corner. And they were saying that a month prior to the murder of Greg DeVillers, Kristen Rossum and her supervisor attended a conference where they had a whole presentation on using the drug fentanyl in suicides, like what happens when someone commits suicide by fentanyl. Once again, this is a toxicology lab. Fentanyl cases are just on the rise in America. They are just something that is just, it's out of control, really. It's all connected to the opioid crisis. We're even having deaths from marijuana now. Marijuana, because it's been laced with fentanyl. Of course, it's the fentanyl that's killing people, not the marijuana itself, but it's at the same time. Fentanyl is just very dangerous. So what happened was, Kristen Rossum and her boyfriend slash supervisor attending this conference, and one commentator, or just sort of one person commenting on the documentary, rather, said that they got the blueprint on how to commit this murder, and the San Diego taxpayers paid for it all. So it's like, it's just kind of um, a very unfortunate thing that's often not thought of. And you really have to kind of question the level of arrogance, the level of recklessness, the level of carelessness and disregard for the law that somebody like Kristen Rossum would have experienced. She was a mid-twenties a woman who had a successful career, rebounding from addiction nonetheless. Things should have been going on the right track, but at the same time, she's going to try and then use fentanyl to murder her husband so that she could be with this other guy. And it's back to the same stuff that we've discussed in some very recent cases. Why not get a divorce? Well, image, that was a very big one. 
She really thought that it would affect her professional reputation, her image. She got she divorced her husband and started taking on this affair with um, some her supervisor. So also you have to wonder though there must be kind of some some sort of deep held animosity toward this particular individual to actually murder them as opposed to just leaving. I mean they didn't even have any children at the time. It's like it would have been. It would have been easy to get a divorce, but it also would have been sloppy, and it would have caused some social backlash, something that she was so afraid of that she tried to murder him with. She stole some fentanyl from the toxicology lab, mixed it in water, and then gave it to her husband one day. And it was actually seven times the lethal dose of fentanyl. Then, after Greg de Villers was incapacitated, deceased, she began to stage the scene, sprinkling flower petals around the room. When they did sort of a dramatization, like a dramatic recreation of the case, they really show um, Greg spread out on the bed with flower petals all around him, which is kind of a recreation of a scene in the movie, American Beauty. And that's actually why this is called the American Beauty murder. But um, when they talked about this as like describing it in real life, they actually said most of the flower petals were just on the floor, and they said that um, it, she sprinkled the flower petals in such an unrealistic way that it was an instant giveaway that the scene was staged. Like in the terms of the way somebody would have gone from the bed to the floor if she had tried to perform CPR on him. Like they just said it was done in such an unrealistic way that there's no, that they just, it looks so blatantly staged. I didn't really get complete clarification on that. Because that one of the things that they said against that, um, they said that it would have been impossible for someone to ingest seven times the lethal dose of fentanyl and then stage the scene. But I mean, like, obviously he could have put the flower petals on the floor first and then just swallowed down a glass of water and just kind of leaned back. I mean, I'm not trying to be silly or anything. That was definitely possible, but... I mean, if I'm going to take their word for it, they said that it just the scene was arranged in a way that was blatantly staged and blatantly false. There were, there's no possible way that uh, this could have been a genuine case of suicide. Furthermore, the family spoke out very clearly. Greg DeVillers was somebody who was very adamantly opposed to drug use. I mean, and that makes sense because he's the guy that got Kristen Rossum off of drugs. This is one of the cases, though, where it really turns into just kind of something where it's almost becoming all about the perpetrator and less about the victim. So the only concluding note is the police arrived and Kristen Rossum wasn't with her husband. She was in a different room. She wasn't performing CPR on him. And they actually found ways to prove that, or at least argue, that when she claimed she was on the 911 call performing CPR on him, she was actually just like making noise and wasn't doing any genuine chest compressions or mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But that just kind of brings us to the conviction. They knew that she was lying. They knew that she had access to the toxicology lab. And they very easily found out that this was a case of murder as opposed to suicide. And once again, this is really where it comes to the thing where this is someone, someone that was so t widely talked about, mostly just because you had this young, attractive woman who was accused of murdering her husband, especially just so she could be with another man. It's a consistent pattern that we see with murder cases. I mean, people don't want to get the divorce. They don't want to do even the trial separation. They're just worried about the backlash. They're worried about how it's going to affect them on all ends of the spectrum, financially even, but that's not exactly in this case. And also, you like once again, it's kind of the thought process, but yes, Kristen Rossum was convicted, sentenced to life without parole in the California state penitentiary system. She's actually held in the largest prison in the state for female offenders. But one of the interesting things is she stood to profit up to $60 million from this case. How is that possible? She's in prison selling her story, interviews, movie rights, book deal, all of those things. And the family of Greg DeVillers actually took her to court to try and uh, 
sort of like garnish the royalties if she were to ever do that. And you you got to be wondering, like, how do these criminals get away with selling their story? Well, we had a big discussion about this in the O.J. Simpson case. Remember O.J. Simpson was involved with the book If I Did It, Here's How, or Here's How It Happened, the exact title. And I started following the channel Lionel Nation because they talked about the O.J. Simpson case. And, and he's a lawyer, so like what he was saying was, you have to let people profit from selling their stories no matter who they are. If you just sort of set the precedent that someone cannot profit from their story because they've done an illegal action, well, Martin Luther King Jr. was in a Birmingham jail at a time. Rosa Parks was doing something illegal by not giving up her seat on the bus. But these people were actually standing up to injustice. And if they aren't allowed to spread their story, and why wouldn't they be allowed to profit from their life stories, even though they've done some things that were quote-unquote illegal? So it's just the law has to kind of function in that way. But at the same time, it's kind of a double-edged sword. People like Kristen Rossum like O.J. Simpson, would be able to be able to profit from, well, murder. And O.J. Simpson wasn't convicted, but Kristen Rossum was. She was convicted of murder, and I didn't really find that they've, um, they've put out a number of books about her. I don't know if they've uh, made an exact movie yet. I'll keep looking. But the thing is, it's just like, this is kind of a case of arrogance. It's a case of someone who thought that they could just outsmart everyone in the silliest of all possible ways. I mean, she worked in a toxicology lab, and she's trying to poison him? No one's going to draw that connection? I mean, like, where's this fentanyl coming from that he would be mixing in water and then ingesting? It's just a very, very arrogant and selfish and almost demented process. But, you know, it's like once someone gets to that level in life when they're going to start plotting the murder of their husband because they don't just want a divorce, I mean, things start to get a little bit weird. And I do mean that. Bizarre, abnormal, the thought process gets abnormal. I mean, it seems like it would have been so much easier for her to just kind of cut the marriage off. But once again, she had to protect her image and reputation. This is a case, though, where a certain amount of people kind of believe that she is innocent. Where, I mean, like I even told you, it sounded kind of weird that the authorities were so convinced that the uh, body of Greg de Villers was staged based on the arrangement of the flowers. And I didn't really completely follow their explanations. But at the same time, the narrative is very convincing that Kristen Rossum is guilty. And it's also like... I mean, it's also, so, there are just so many consistencies in her life that are leading down a pathway of destruction, battling addiction, having the affair, attending the conference where they talk about using fentanyl and suicides, all of these things coming together at once. And I'm not like a police officer, an investigator, or a lawyer right now, just like, when you're looking at that as a human being, that really seems like it's two and two together, and it's a very clear solution. And sadly, it really seems like she is guilty. But this is just another case where the attention falls on the perpetrator because of her appearance. Because um, she's an attractive 20-something woman. And they just, people are just so puzzled by the idea that someone like her can be a murderer. But we have an entire series called Snapped, Women Who Kill, that featured Kristen Rostrom because... People from all backgrounds commit murders. All backgrounds, every race and color, every gender, male and female, all of that, they all commit murders. Greed knows no boundaries. And that's the thing that we all just have to recognize. And I don't really... It's really difficult to sort of see someone fall in love with somebody like this. Like, we even talked about this in the Chris Watts case a little bit, how... People are sending him love letters in prison and uh, the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case as well. Someone's trying to get engaged to her in prison. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, had multiple people doing the same thing. Where is this infatuation with the perpetrators coming from? That's probably just someone who... 
thinks that they can't find love anywhere else, so they start developing these infatuations with murderers who are in jail because I think this person is desperate enough to love me back. I mean, it's just a very bizarre thought process, but, um, and also just somebody like Kristen Rossum, maybe she just comes across as a naturally tame and mild personality, but she murdered her husband because she wanted to protect her reputation and she didn't want to get in trouble for having an affair with an office colleague. Which, I mean, he did lose his job as well over this for um, not divulging certain information about the case. And, and, you know, it's like, that's just sort of karma, I suppose. I mean, he lied and he withheld vital information about the case from his workplace authorities as well as the police. It happened. Well, anyway, what do you think about, like, the kind of thought process of people who commit these types of murders? Because in the pre recent weeks on the channel, we've mentioned a lot of them. Are they so arrogant they think that they can't get caught? Do they think that they are so brilliant that they can fool everyone? And do they think that they are so above other people that they can just outsmart everyone? And that they, Or are they just kind of living in a fantasy land where they think that they have the ability to act without consequences? What really is the answer in all this? That's all for me now. Until next time.